Today, I'm going to attempt to find the words to talk about the Cygnus Beta universe by Karen Lord, where we have three books in it so far. I, I did hear that there are plans in the far off future for a fourth book, which makes me incredibly excited as someone who is incredibly invested in this universe and these characters. It's, it's a great time. So if you don't know, I love Karen Lord books. I come into this video with that bias. I actually just had an interview with her that you will see live on this channel in a few days. And if it's already live by the time you're watching this video, I will have linked the interview down in the description below. So know that I come into this with the bias of really liking the author, really liking the works, and I'm going to try and make sure you have the right expectations for yourself as a reader before diving into this. But it, it, it's hard for me to not just praise the works of this. Even when things don't land exactly with my tastes, I appreciate the projects of these books so massively. <laughs> so that, you know, not really a disclaimer, just, you know, recognition of my biases out of the way. What are you going to find in these books? And you're going to find really cool planets and different cultures. And that's like a really basic way of saying it. But at its core, this is doing what a lot of science fiction has always been doing since the dawn of time that we've had books set in space that were exploring planets. But it does it in a way that it's incredibly unique and it's very fresh. So we're still going to be focusing on different subspecies of human, which is something sci-fi has looked at a lot, like especially when humans have been separated from each other for a while and different cultures emerge, different genetic traits. That's what we have here. We have four seed planets and a couple like colonized planets. One of them is Earth, and we'll, we'll get to Earth a little bit later. And on these other planets, there's some people with different psionic abilities. And we start in Cygnus Beta, which is kind of a patchwork planet that has all of these cultures kind of represented to some small degree or another. And the plot conceit of the first book allows for even more cultures to enter. And it's, it's very fun to explore. I will get into the best of all possible worlds in a second. I'm trying to not get ahead of myself. But there's a focus on different cultures and different types of species that exist among different planets, which of course means there are galactic politics. And that is also a huge focus of this series. And it is tied to transportation and the transport of goods and there are different fun transportation methods that are both familiar and unique. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all I'll get into for right now. And of course, different tech, especially focus on communication tech. We have this one planet that only d like has auditory um, communication. Just, there's no texting. There's no visual communication. It is all through what are called audio plugs. So there is this whole sense of exploration and discovery. And like I said, it's very familiar, but the combination of all of it and the inspirations that Karen Lord brought from our contemporary world into this makes it such a refreshing piece of science fiction and especially the questions she is choosing to ask. And so we'll go through kind of each of the books. Up front, I want to say that I call this a series because I they're all in the same universe. And I do think that you need to read these books in publication order. I, I guess you could, in theory, pick any of them up because they are all complete internal thoughts in terms of plot. But in terms of world building, if you start with the Blue Beautiful World, you will have very little context for a lot of what's going on for the first third of that book. Because it assumes that you have the grounding and the world building that was developed in The Best of All Possible Worlds and The Galaxy Game. Um, and she's very intentional about what nuggets of world building she will give you in each of these novels. She knows way more about the world building structure than you will ever know, and you are sometimes in the heads of characters that are unreliable or also just as clueless as you are, so you don't get to learn all the intricacies of what's going on, but it is always self-consistent and you will always get revelations that you need to understand the whole if you're patient. But that said, that means we're, we're not in a Robert Jordan of Wheel of Time situation where you can just jump in the third book and there's going to be an exposition reminding you about what was taught to you already in the best of all possible worlds. That's not how the world building style works. And for that reason, I do think you have to start at the beginning. And that doesn't even include that there are reoccurring characters in these books and they do go through satisfying arcs. So if you start at the end, you might not have the same payoff for one of the arcs of the characters because you didn't see where they came from. I know there's allusions and references to where they came from. You weren't there with them in that moment. Now, one of the things that makes it difficult to call this a trilogy or a series is that even Karen Lord kind of talks about it doesn't really work in the way you would expect a trilogy to work where it's a one story broken into three parts. And you're not even following the same characters and you're not even following the same scope. The best of all possible worlds does not set you up with the right expectations for what is to come with the galaxy game or the blue beautiful world. Um, the galaxy game and the blue beautiful world 
they feel more like they are in the same series with each other. They feel tonally more similar. They have a similar character work and scope. But The Best of All Possible Worlds is this more intimate story that I have a standalone review for, so I'm not going to wax poetically about it here. And if you've watched my channel, you know it's one of my favorite things. But The Best of All Possible Worlds is just very different in project and what it wants to focus on. The lens to tell the story it wants to tell happens to be more zoomed in and happens to make it so you have a more character-driven narrative. And it's not that the other books don't have character-driven narratives, but it's not in a traditional way. And actually, the characters that the author cares about more are actually entire societies. And I think sometimes as readers, we're so used to connecting to a character and connecting and like empathetically to societies and caring for them the same way we do an individual character is not something that comes easily. So I think that disconnect will exist after you read about Della Rua in The Best of All Possible Worlds and then you are with Raffi and he doesn't get the same treatment in the Galaxy game as she does, if that makes sense. So that's the first expectation that I want out there is that you should still read them in order and that you're not going to get the same book in each of this series. You're going to have the same universe. It's the same grounded universe. It's all self-consistent, but the projects of each one are different. So briefly, The Best of All Possible Worlds is about after Sidira, this planet can no longer be inhabited and they lose a large portion of their female population. And so we have these refugees, mostly male, coming to Cygnus Beta and they get thrown into the bureaucracy of it all and need to figure out, well, how will we live on this planet? And part of that is they go on this expedition around this planet to see if they can find people who are genetically similar enough and who also want to be a part of their culture as they're trying to keep alive what was lost. So you really get to explore this planet and it's so interesting and unique. It's very episodic in nature and it's very intimate. You're focused on this team of individuals. There are interpersonal bonds that just flourish and grow. I truly love this story and it also focuses on a lot of individual troubles and situations. I think this one's the easiest one for me to recommend to people. Not only is the world building rich and I love the choices and imagination that she takes to imagine the universe and how they would handle this circumstance, but also I think on a character level this is just the easiest one to just really relate to them. Grace is really funny. I, I love this book. Now, the Galaxy game is focused on something else. So I mentioned that the first book, Sidira, is a planet that no longer can be inhabited. They lose a huge part of their population and their status in the galaxy. There is this huge power vacuum when they're taken off the table. And the Galaxy game is then trying to answer the question, well, what happens? And like I said, there, there are four different planets. There's four different cultures. There's some side colonies. There are a blending of some cultures. And so what she chose to do in this book is we have multiple character perspectives, some that show up more than others. And I guess you could say there are some characters that are our quote unquote main characters, but it's not done in a way that I would say is traditional. Um, if you've read Malazan by Steven Erickson, I think it's more along that fragmented character work style where you're going to be popping in and out of character perspectives and they're going to be doing stuff off page that you don't know about and that will be important important, but though things that happen off page are what you're used to as a reader seeing on page. So I think that's another expectation to know is that there are certain character development moments that you're not going to get to see in real time. And if you know me as a reader, that's normally a thing I don't like. <laughs> normally a thing that I'm just like, but why didn't I get to see that? I would have loved to see them learn that information and how they responded to that, etc. But I think this really worked for me because I was just having so much fun on this new planet and trying to figure out what was happening because the perspectives I'm following are either young generation and the old generation, and we don't get nearly as many old generation perspectives as we do young. In the old generation, there's a lot of ominous tones. There's stuff happening, like I said, the power vacuum being filled, and they're all nervous, and they're like, what do we do? And the young generation, they're trying to start their lives. They're trying to be young adults that make mistakes and forge their own path, and they keep getting mixed up in things and suddenly they're at the center of things that are really important but they're not our typical chosen one characters who are supposed to just magically be good at saving the day and so that's kind of how we are viewing it and i think it's very realistic but also because of its realism is really jarring because it doesn't quite hit the plot trope beats that we are used to in this type of story but the world is really cool and there are moments for me when i was reading it where i got confused at the beginning but then by the end, I was like, oh, that's why I was introduced that idea there. And this idea makes sense now. Like there's a lot of trust that I have in her as an author that I always get payoff from. 
Also, you know I like Nine Fox Gambit by Yoon Ha Lee. I tend to like intricate worlds where I have to piece things together. And these are series where there are puzzle pieces. To piece things together, there are revelations. It's not spoon-fed to you. It's a little jarring, but I kind of always knew enough to be grounded in the moment and could just trust that eventually I will things will make sense. I kind of had to be like our characters in this book. Like, Raffi is one of our main characters in this book who travels to this new planet that he's never been to before, and I'm with him, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know what this place is like, and it has this whole fascinating new type of social credit that's very different than any economic system I've ever read, and, you know, he suddenly finds himself a key player that many people want to invest in, and he has to figure out, well, where does he want to be, and there are these new old discoveries, and these bigger galactic politics going on and how does he fit into that is he even something someone that can just like grasp all of that as like a 15 year old <laughs> and so the galaxy game i think because of that can feel really intimidating or you can feel very lost in it but especially on reread i i really appreciated the project and its focus on the role of sports in galactic affairs because in this game there's this game called messenger and it's not only a representation of the past in a past war but it's also a game that people are very invested in. It's a key part of culture, and anything that's a key part of culture is a key part of politics. And it's just really, I think, well done. I really appreciate this book, even if, like, personally, I would love more character moments because that's just who I am as a reader. But all these other elements were so strong, and I understand that I think in some ways for the story that Karen wanted to tell, this is what it had to be. The Blue Beautiful World kind of runs with a similar type of, we get a bunch of characters' perspectives. It's basically split into a three-act structure, and within each of those acts, you're with different characters. So you think you might be invested in some characters that are introduced early on, and then it's just like, quick pivot. It's like, no, we're focusing on these people now. Because again, these characters are important. They're not just there for window dressing. They have motivations, they have trials, they, they have personality. But we are not meant to be tied to them. We are tied to the situation at large. And this one is the first contact story. Earth has been mentioned throughout this series at this point, And this is the story where it's like, okay, so what happens when Earth finally learns that they are a part of this galaxy and how will they make their first steps to be integrated? And there's more complications involved based off some things that we know politically from the galaxy game, but that's the big question. And that's an interesting thing to try and answer. And so if you've read the Galaxy game and you liked it or it didn't you know, turn you off on that character work style, you will still like The Blue Beautiful World because it's very familiar and similar to that. And it also plays around with the imagination of also what are secrets of Earth that we don't even know about. And it also takes place in like the 22nd century. So there's some really interesting tech that's going on, like the, the um, role of VR, really different in this last book. So that's just broad strokes, spoiler free, what are in these books and things that I would maybe want you to know before you go into them because it probably might affect your reading experience. If you're expecting the best of all possible worlds for three books, that's just not what you're going to get. It's just not happening. <laughs> that wasn't the goal of the last two books in the series. I will say I was told that there will be a fourth book and that makes me incredibly excited. I don't know if I've already said this in this video because I have tried to record this video a few times and I'm not very good at finding the words to describe why this series is so good, challenging, unique, because I do think that's the thing is especially for the galaxy game and the blue beautiful world, the world building is a rewarding type of challenging that I know not everyone wants in their reading experiences. Um, and I do think that's where it shines. Sometimes I always say I'm like kind of can be driven by world building when I consume stories. And I think that's where I am with this because it did give me buy into a lot of these cultures. And in the background, I'm not even noticing it, but I am invested in these long reaching arches of these characters that are not center stage. They're not meant to be center stage, but I'm still invested. Um, so I do recommend reading The Best of All Possible Worlds, and each of these books do wrap up as their own complete thoughts. I just do say you have to read them in order. It's not a situation where I think they're all just companion novels where you can just jump in here or there and explore the world. I do think they each build on each other like a foundation to help you get the broad picture. Another thing I'll say for the last book is, in a stroke of realistic world building, is that the names are all going to be different for things that we've been familiar with in the first two books. Now, there is a glossary in the back that tells you which are which, and you can kind of tell from context clues within the work, but on Earth, 
the planets in the sky are not named the same way because they didn't know that they had these different names in the universe, so they have different names for planets. So when we're referring to names and subspecies of humans, they have different names in the Blue Beautiful World than what we're used to in the first two. And that, for me, was a bit jarring. I'm like, oh, I have to learn all these new words because of these dumb Earth people who don't know that they're part of this universe. This is how they're learning. But it's really interesting and kind of like um, the Galaxy game. It includes um, the importance of pop culture and specifically pop artists and how they can shape cultural moments and momentum, which I do think is a part of society and politics and culture that we don't usually take into account in these broad stories. So I don't know if I've sold this series for you or not, but I just wanted to have this in the universe because it is one of my favorite science fiction space worlds to just wander around in. And the rereadability of this series is top notch because of its complexity, but also because they're very short. Like they are each 300 pages, if that. I think my arc of the Blue Beautiful World is like 280. So these three books are about 900 pages. So it's not that hard to read them. They're not, the writing itself is not too dense. Um, it's actually really my one of my favorite writing styles. I really enjoy Karen Lord's writing. But altogether, this is the trilogy so far. Well, the series of books in it. So if you're like, man, now I want to reread that because knowing this context, I want to like look at it in that lens, you can easily do that. And knowing where arcs kind of go, you can be invested in different characters at different points because you're no longer jarred in the sense of, well, who should I be focusing on? Because I do think as readers, we can get hung up on that. It's like, well, I need to know who I'm rooting for or who's the bad guy or where is my focus? And I'm like that as well. So the Galaxy game on reread was way more rewarding for me, even though I still loved it on my first read. I gave it like four and a half stars because that's who I am. So that's this video. <laughs> um, if you just want to leave an emoji to let me know you're here, leave a planet emoji for obvious reasons. We've got so many references to worlds, so anything galactic or world-based. Let me know if you have any questions about this series spoiler-free, and I would be glad to answer them down in the comments. Do you think you're going to pick this up? Have you tried any of the later books in the series, and what would you you know, also add to the spoiler free review for others who want to pick it up. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.